Okay, um, let's start. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining for this uh, open air webinar. Um, uh, we will have um, one hour uh, webinar with um, um, so short presentations uh, and then uh, uh, question and answers um, uh, moments. So we have uh, we want to have time uh, to answer questions. Uh, we have some questions already that you have um, sent us uh, via the registration form, but you can also put other questions. So use the question and answer button to ask questions. You can ask questions during the, um, the presentations from the, the speakers, from Thomas and, and Prodromos, uh, but we will try to, to answer the questions after the, the presentation. But if you if you have a question, just in the in the moment that they are presenting, you can just put the, the, the question and we will answer it uh, at at the end. So um, it's really a pleasure to to have uh, so many participants and so many people interested in the, in this webinar. So um, the the webinar we will have um, Thomas Margoni from uh, Glasgow University. Uh, and Prodromos uh, Tsiavos from Matina Research and Innovation Center. Um, we are all part of the, the open air team, collaborating in different areas of, of open air, from, from the, the training and the policy activities to also some support to technical, to technical activities. And we, we will run this uh, webinar. So I will give in um, three, four minutes um, really a short overview about the, the support materials that Open Air have available, focusing on the, the new uh, support materials that we have related with the um, with, um, legal issue and, uh, and, our, and RDM uh, issues. And then uh, we will have um, uh, Thomas Margoni presenting uh, the guides and the content that we have from copyright licensing and research that the guides, and then um, addressing the issues related with personal data in open science, uh, Prodromos will also present uh, the guides, the content, and highlight some of the, the, the main issues that we have when we address this kind of uh, topics. Um, and then we have already selected some questions and answers from the registration form, and you can also put other questions during the, the, the webinar. So uh, Open Air uh, have uh, an Open Science Help Desk. We have uh, we run the Help Desk uh, based on different kinds of um, uh, support tools. So we have some support materials like the guides that we are presenting today, fact sheets, FAQs. We have a ticket system that you uh, all the um, the users from researchers to research support staff can use to ask questions. And of course, we have a direct support at the national level run by the National Open Access Desks. We have several um, activities uh, related with, so specifically uh, training activities, so like webinars like we are doing today and the uh, workshops. We have several workshops already planned for 2019. Please check the, the agenda in the, in the Open Air portal. And uh, um, we, we have also some activities uh, around all the, um, the support and training for the new uh, open air services and, uh, and products. Uh, specifically, um, so we have several um, uh, support materials related with the issues that we are discussing today, so the legal issues, um, and, and, uh, and also around research that uh, sharing and management. Uh, so we have, um, uh, I would like to highlight uh, that we have uh, two primers, um, so where we have a kind of uh, the basics about open science, open access to publications and uh, research data management. We have the, the guides, uh, so I, I, I really want to highlight that we are, are um, updating the guide section in the portal like every month. We are, since uh, October that we have released the new open air portal, every month we have two or three new guides and we will have the same uh, until the summer. For sure you will find new guides um, targeting different stakeholders and, uh, and the 
approach uh, so related with different topics uh, you can uh, check the portal and also as i said check the agenda of the, of the workshops uh, we have several fact sheets and uh, so we are always updating also the faqs and um, this this all these new materials are, are also due to the fact that now we are pushing to have like a kind of task forces uh, to build more capacity and um, capacity on the three main areas research data management uh, open science policies and the legal issues and the, the result of this uh, push to have more uh, support and training um, content related with the uh, legal uh, is the fact that we now have several guides new guides available and this is what we want to uh, to present you during this um, this webinar to highlight the new guides that we have related with copyright licensing and personal data that we have available already in the in the portal so we will focus mainly in these four guides and then other topics that thomas and prodromos will will um, identify as relevant for all of us so how do i know if my research data is protected how do i license my research data and can i reuse someone else's research data are the guides that we will highlight related with copyright and licensing and then related with data protection and open science how to deal with sensitive data and, and prodromos will um, for sure identify more relevant topics that we need to uh, focus on the, for the, the work we are doing in our projects as a researcher and then also as a research support staff that need to provide support to researchers and, and um, project coordinators in our um, institutions. So um, now I will uh, give the floor to um, um, Thomas to um, present himself if he wants and also of course to, to detail and to um, to present the um, the guides that we have specifically addressing copyright and licensing issues so please thomas you can now share your screen and start your presentation thank you very much pedro thank you for the kind introduction so let me share my screen first Okay, so I have uh, a couple of slides. Uh, well, good morning, everyone, first of all, and thank you for joining us in uh, such a great number. Um, I have a couple of slides that I think are useful just to set the stage, and then I will move uh, directly through, you could call it a live uh, uh, demonstration of uh, the guides that uh, uh, Pedro just referred to. I think it's uh, it's interesting to show how where the guides are. Uh, we already have the links, but have a visual feedback um, and have a quick overlook uh, of what kind of information uh, they cover. This could also form the basis for additional Q and A's later on. I think that is important uh, to clarify right away um, a few um, terminological aspects because obviously there, is, there are at least, there are many, but at least two main uh, dimensions here. The dimension, the point of view, the approach, uh, the understanding of the researcher, so the scientific community, and what they mean by, what you mean by research, what we mean by research data. And then there is the law. And the law has uh, a completely different uh, definition and viewing of what research data and databases are. And I think this is a first major uh, element that has to be addressed because often it happens that uh, we think we're talking about the same things because they have the same name, data or research data, but as a matter of fact, in our heads, in our minds, in our disciplines, we are talking about very different things. And this is a first cause of uh, uh, frustration. So here I have uh, just a couple of very basic points, but I think they are instrumental to what we're going to say later on. There is no clear legal definition of what uh, research data are. Hmm? 
there is no uh, a, a copyright act or or a research data act saying research data is. So it's a matter of uh, um, norms, often community scientific uh, academic norms to define what research data are. But as we know, these kind of norms uh, are not um, engraved in stone. They are fluid. They may change over time, over discipline, and over uh, um, jurisdiction. Do we have at least a definition of what data is, are from a, point of, from a legal point of view? Partially. The law talks about data, but talks about data in many different ways. It may refer to copyright aspects, to uh, related rights to copyright, to other IP rights, to personal data. And in all these cases, even though you may think, well, it's data, as a researcher, I don't really know how a discipline that is not mine defines a certain concept. I just need to know what I can do. Can I do this, yes or no? This is not my job. This is something that you know, someone else should do and should give me a clear answer. That's what we're trying to do. It's not easy. It's not easy because the law attaches very, very different consequences to different categorization. And this is what we're trying to do today and throughout the guides. But I think that right now, what is really important to understand is that it's not sufficient, even for you as researchers or as PIs, it's not sufficient to say, well, this is data. You have to go a step further. Um, it may not be what you want to hear, but uh, um, you need, if you go a step further, it's going to be a lot easier for all of us, including for us, for the legal expert, to give you more specific feedback on what you need to do. I haven't clarified this introductory aspect. Uh, in, my, in the first part of this presentation, I will be focusing on aspect of copyright related rights, database, and licensing issues. Whereas in the second part, Prodromos will be talking about uh, personal data. And the reason why we treat them separately is because, uh, believing it or not, they are very different legal concepts and they behave in very, very different ways. And this is a very important aspect to keep in mind once again. So we have produced uh, from the, let's say, copyright point of view, uh, three main guides that uh, I will show to you in a moment from the portal. The first one is, how do I know if my research data is protected? The second one is, they should follow uh, some sort of a logical narrative. First of all, you need to know whether what you have is protected. Once you know whether and how it is protected, you want to know how you can license it, meaning how you can tell other people how to use it. And finally, when it's you who wants to reuse someone else's research data, what do you need to know? To complement these three guides, we have uh, um, an additional uh, companion guide that uh, uh, tackles directly repositories, but is something that I would nevertheless uh, recommend you to have a look at, especially if you are in charge or in coordination of research projects which is how um, to make your uh, repository open science compliant. It includes uh, a lot of additional information on licensing aspects, but it's perhaps a bit more, it has a lot more detail, it can get a bit more complicated. So your starting point should be the first three guides, and then if you are uh, still liking it and you are not extremely bored, you can move to the fourth one. So. Let's move uh, to the guides. I'm stopping for a second on the sharing because I think that's the only way that I know how to do this. Okay, so hopefully everything worked fine and we are all seeing um, the first guide. Yes, yes, yes. It's everything okay. Great. Thank you for the feedback. 
So how do I know if my research data is protected is the first guide. Um, as you see, we try to be as concise as possible because uh, after many years of uh, research, we finally came to the conclusion that you don't, people don't like to read hundreds and hundreds of pages of legal analysis, which is surprising because you know, it's very interesting legal analysis but it turns out that no one really reads them. So how can we, and this is not a trivial question, how can we distill it so much, so many details, so much complexity in a way that can be easily understand by people, by researchers who do this every day, but who should not be um, excessively concerned in terms of uh, knowledge uh, cost and time cost uh, in uh, the legal dimension of their research activity. So this is the idea behind these guides. And we're very eager to know your opinions, your feedback uh, on any aspect. As Peter said, we are constantly developing the guides, not only content-wise, but also in terms of uh, graphics, uh, um, how to make them even easier to understand. Uh, we will probably in the future implement uh, visuals, etc. Uh, but obviously, for this, your opinion would be would be very very useful. So please feel free to um, share your views on this. Now, regarding the content, uh, obviously here, as uh, I mentioned at the beginning, we do have a few. Um, questions uh, on what is research data and once we can uh, if not precisely define it at least have a common core of uh, situations where we say okay this is research data then the following question is well how is it protected when is it protected is it always protected I would say we'll not go through uh, all the text, uh, we don't have the time and I think it wouldn't be very useful, but I invite you to go through it. What I will offer you is a general overview um, of uh, the, um, of, of, you know, what, how to determine or what are the main legal issues here. Um, so, as I was saying, the law doesn't really have uh, a definition of uh, data, it doesn't have a definition of data sets uh, either, but the law defines databases. And that's something that also has to be kept in mind. The law has a definition of database, and when we speak about legal issues, we have to make sure that we only call databases what the law defines databases. Because otherwise we're again talking about different things and uh, and uh, therefore we may not understand each other. So here I have the definition of the law. It's, as you see, quite broadly, is a collection of independent words, data or other materials are arranged in a systematic or methodological way and individually accessible by electronic or other means. This is an extremely important definition because either we have this structure of independent words, so here, independent works means that a literary work, so a text, a poem, an article, cannot be a database because there is no, uh, uh, there are not independent works and they are not individually accessible. There is a, a narrative sequence that has to be followed in a literary work. Just to give you an example of works, so works here means something that is protected by copyright. Imagine. A database of scientific articles. Data, not really defined, but something that is not work. So measurements, uh, um, numbers, uh, um, everything you can think of could potentially fit into this uh, definition of data or other materials, but they have to be arranged in a systematic or methodological way. If they are not, then we don't have a database for legal purposes. Obviously, things are not uh, this easy because uh, the law says that, well, if this systematic and methodological um, organization is original, 
and we see it in here in copyright, then there is a copyright in data in the database, but all in the structure. It doesn't extend to the data. So if the data composing the database are not protected themselves, a database is only a form of protection for the structure, for how you have selected or arranged those data, not for the data themselves, which I understand can be quite counterintuitive. And on top of this, we have this weird word that we saw already, the Swai Generous Database, right? Which is a purely, so what I said so far, imagine that more or less applies everywhere in the world. There may be differences, but not too, too marked. In the case of the Swai Generous Database, right? We're talking about a, a purely European creation. This right, it's what, in, as a matter of fact, can protect uh, data. So you still have to have the, the database, regardless of whether your collection is original or not, if you have put, and the definition is a substantial investment in obtaining, verifying, or presenting the data, then you have this additional right that protects extractions of substantial amounts of data. So it's not a single datum that is protected, but if someone else is want to copy your entire database or a substantial amount, then this uh, Swai Generous database right uh, will forbid that. But obviously, once again, uh, uh, this is just uh, the surface. There are many other considerations to be made, um, chiefly, for example, the fact that uh, uh, the Swai Generous database right only protects data that has been obtained, not data that has been created. And this is a very uh, important aspect because that's trigger, triggered a lot of litigation um, uh, in Europe about what uh, data, uh, when a certain amount of data has been created or obtained. And obviously, don't make the mistake of thinking with a scientific uh, uh, mindset. Um, it's not an epistemological analysis that the court will do often, sometimes they do on whether you know you create a data when you record a measurement or the data already existed you're just obtaining it from nature here uh, a lot of attention is paid to the to competition aspect so are we created a monopoly right over single source databases if this is the case probably the data will be considered created and is not protected if the same amount of data could be independently obtained through measurement from you know, a competitor, then probably the data is obtained and uh, there is no Sway Generous database right protection. Sorry, I won't say anything else about this because uh, I understand it's complicated, but I want to give you a dimension of what the law is saying about these, uh, uh, these uh, aspects and what we cover in the guides. So once we have understood whether um, our research data is protected, then uh, we can move uh, to the second stage, which is how do I license my research data? Now here, maybe uh, we are more familiar with some of uh, these uh, concepts and topics, and we refer to licenses. Obviously, a common mistake is to think that a license protects something that's wrong it is copyright or rights that related to corporate such as the you know database right that protect and they are automatic so you don't have to do anything uh, when you create something uh, when you write a piece of code when you uh, write a scientific article you're already protected by copyright as well so you don't have to do anything you don't have even to write down your name or you know the usual um, corporate notice is a circle C. All those things can help, but they're not necessary. So copyright protects you. A license is a permission. License means permission. So since the default is all rights reserved because corporate gives you this property right, then if you want other people to reuse your data or your articles, then you have to give them a permission. And this permission is a license. It can be a restrictive license, as when you buy commercial products, you have to set that an 
end user license agreement, or it can be an open license, such as Creative Commons. In this case, um, we are talking about licenses that allows you always to reproduce, redistribute, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But there are conditions. Now, we go through some of the conditions, um, but these are normally well known. We have other uh, more basic guides that explain how Creative Commons work. If, you know, this is a question we can uh, easily go there. A normal debate here is, uh, well, uh, uh, I have to apply a CC BY or a CC ZERO to my uh, database. It depends, right? So what normally we recommend is CC0 because if you apply a CC BY, you are requiring attribution for your data when the law doesn't really request attribution because there are no more rights of attribution for data. So by applying a CC BY, as a matter of fact, you are restricting even further than what the law requires reuse. So that's why normally for data, we recommend CC0. Um, that said, there is a reasonable uh, a community expectation in some areas where you say, well, but you know, I spent a lot of effort in collecting this data. I'm happy to share it, but at least I would like to have recognition, like for people to cite me. Well, you can obtain this in two ways. You can do CC0 and then kindly request that uh, uh, attribution is given to you. This is what Europeana does for certain uh, uh, data sets that they have, for example. But this is not legally enforceable. This is just a, a request. But it's a, it's a norm, it's a, a social norm in the scientific community, like when you cite someone. So normally it works. If you really, really want to be attributed, then you can apply a CC BY. That's, you know, maybe not uh, the best of the best of the best of the solutions for open science approaches, but it's still something that if you really want, you can do. You are restricting the reuse of data to some extent, but you're still open access compliant. Important to keep in mind that uh, um, non-commercial and non-derivatives are non-open access compliant. So if you have to publish in open access because your funders require it, requires it, and uh, you cannot use uh, uh, those conditions. Very quickly to the last slide, also for the sake of time, uh, can I reuse someone else's research data? This is somehow um, the logical uh, follow-up from the previous slide. Well, you need to, there needs to be, well, you need to know whether the research data that you want to reuse is protected or not often it is not protected. If it is protected, then you have to look at the license. If this license is CC0, then you can do almost anything you want. If this license is CC BY, or if the license, sorry, just to follow the, the structure uh, of my previous uh, uh, guide, if, you, if the license is CC0 plus uh, a kind request to attribute, then, you know, legal obligation, it's CC0, but there is a moral obligation to attribute uh, when you reuse uh, the data to the original maker. If the license is CC BY, well, then there is a contractual obligation uh, to attribute in the way that is specified in the original database. Obviously, these are just the, it's, let's say, the broad picture. It's how you should approach uh, the questions or the problems when they are presented to you as uh, researchers, as uh, uh, um, PIs, as research coordinators. But obviously, normally, there are much more specific issues and questions um, and we are happy to, um, to answer them or discuss them further or even include them in the guides. But what is really important is that from the outset, you understand these basic rules. Uh, you have to understand that uh, as researchers, 
you need to have at least a basic understanding of how the law regulates this area, because if you do it, you may avoid certain mistake at the very beginning in the phase of designing your research experiment. That if you made this mistake, it would be much, much, much more harder to address them later on. It will be costly in terms of legal analysis, in terms of delay in your ability to publish or share your data, etc., etc., etc. You have to become a bit, a little bit, not too much, just a little bit, lawyers as well. Uh, this is how uh, science works nowadays, um, and uh, obviously everyone uh, uh, has its specialties, but um, as much as lawyers have to understand a little bit of science in order to answer certain questions, scientists have to understand a little bit of uh, law in order to uh, address their problems uh, um, in the right way, and hopefully these guides uh, uh, can assist you in this. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Thomas. So um, we have already some questions we will answer at the end, but now um, we give the floor to Prodromos. Please, Prodromos, can you start? Okay, perfect. Thank you. You can uh, put in presentation mode if you, yes, perfect. So, excellent. All right. Thanks, everyone, and thanks for being in this uh, webinar. Uh, it's always exciting to see that there are many, many people interested in uh, legal issues and uh, hopefully they're going to be slightly more enlightened by the time we, who, we, we have finished our presentations. So um, adding and following up from, from um, where Thomas has uh, left us, I would like us to talk a bit about the research data, the GDPR and ask the question, how open is open? So how, how basically can we really have open science in relation to the uh, general data protection uh, directive, uh, regulation? Because what we very frequently hear is that, uh, okay, this, this piece of data set has personal data, so what can I do with it? Does it mean that I cannot really release it or I cannot really release it openly? And I always, when I start talking about this issue, I start with the title of the GDPR, uh, which people don't read, but if you read it, you will see that it has two objectives. One is the protection of uh, the personal, uh, of the natural persons in relation to their personal data, but it's also the free movement of such data. And it's crucial to understand that the objective of the regulation is not to stop the flow of data, but actually to facilitate that. It's just that it needs to happen within a particular framework. So um, there are five uh, elements which I would like to uh, discuss with you today in relation to personal data and open science uh, in order to see what are some very basic and very frequent questions and issues we are facing and how can we tackle them. The first thing is to uh, actually understand the the setting to understand what we're talking about is not always research that takes place within a single organization, uh, but in, in multiple settings, so this is crucial. The second thing is to identify what we want to do with the data. The third thing is what is our legal basis for performing any processing. The fourth thing to understand how this maps on the data management plan or the data life cycle and finally, how the data subject may exercise her rights. In this presentation today, I'm not going to go through basic definitions because we don't have the time and we have quite a bit of that in, in our fact sheets. Uh, but um, um, I think we will return with a more comprehensive uh, guide uh, in relation to how I um, remain uh, compliant to the GDPR while opening my data. So the setting. Uh, there are cases when the researcher will actually do uh, research within a research performing organization. In that sense, you're bound by the legal requirements, which is the implementation of the GDPR that has happened in your country, in your member states. And if it hasn't transposed um, the uh, regulations, uh, which by the way, 
um, they have a direct effect. So the GDPR has a direct effect since May 2018. So it's not necessary for the, your country to have a national law, but because it contains some elements which require further um, elaboration by the national legislature, um, it makes sense to check your national law if it exists. Uh, so one framework is the big framework, the laws in your country and the GDPR. And the second one is if you have an ethics framework with your, your institution. So the first thing you do is that uh, in, in quite a few institutions before um, a research project, internal research project is approved, you need to go through the ethics committee, which very frequently is going to uh, ask questions related to personal data as well. What becomes a bit more complicated is when you have an EU or other collaborative project and there you need to see the ethics and data protection requirements set by the consortium. Now this of course has to do with the national law but also it has to do with third countries. For some reason the autocorrect made it fourth countries but I mean third countries. Um, uh, third countries we mean countries which are outside the EU. And what does it mean if the data are to flow outside the EU or to come from data subjects that are located out, outside the EU? And of course, to check what are the conditions of the call uh, for this particular funding instrument. So the, the uh, important things there is to identify who is the one that sets the conditions for the processing of data. Is it the project um, coordinator? And if that is the case, how are data being stored between the different partners and who is processing, processing them and who is acting as a controller? So in the case of any EU project, you have to answer these questions at the outset of the project. And uh, let me repeat the key questions is, who is the one who sets the um, conditions and purposes of the uh, data processing and that should be the controller and what are the different roles of the different partners within the project it could very well be that the data controller is the coordinator but sometimes you have one partner who's responsible for the infrastructure and that particular partner may operate either as a controller if it has indeed full control over the purposes of the, the purposing of the processing of data or may operate as a processor on behalf of the consortium. So what is really crucial is to understand how the consortium is, is, is structured and who is the one who sets the conditions and who is the one that actually uh, does the processing. Uh, second case which we increasingly see is when you have a tender and there the question is are you data processor or co-controller? So most of the cases you, when you respond, for instance, into an EU uh, tender, uh, you will be a control, a, a processor on behalf of the Commission who is going to be the controller. Classic example, the um, uh, Clarin project, we, which we have seen in Athena, or the ELRC, actually the ELRC project, which we have seen at Athena Reset Center, where the Reset Center doesn't operate uh, as a controller, but as a processor. It doesn't set the conditions and purposes and does not control control fully the, um, the data, but instead it acts on behalf of the Commission. Similar is when you have a commercial entity that comes and asks you to do some research for them, you're again going to operate as a control, as a processor, and that means you need to have a contract that specifically sets the conditions as to how data are to be um, uh, processed. Two more questions. Um, who is the data protection officer? Uh, if we're talking about the first scenario when we have the RPO, uh, you most probably are going to have uh, a data processor, or data um, uh, a DPO uh, who's responsible for the institution. What becomes what it becomes a bit more complicated is when you have a consortium, and then you need to understand how the DPOs of the different organizations um, uh, work um, with each other. Um, the, the other question is how, how does the um, DPO relate to the ethics committee? And here I have to mention three, uh, let's say, actors in our uh, drama. You have the DPO, you have the ethics committee, and you may have a compliance officer or compliance people that are in, responsible for the, the compliance, which may be a third company. Um, so, for instance, it could be that the DPO is a, let's say, a person who's not part of the hierarchy, uh, but is someone that operates as a controller and as an auditor of the organization and its data protection activities. 
you have the compliance people, which are people that really go process by process and conform and comply to the law. And finally, the ethics committee, who deals with issues which are far broader than the data protection issues. And they are not just issues that uh, are, um, um, are defined by the relevant legislation. They could be also rules that the institution or institutions have uh, defined themselves and operate as forms of self-regulation. So moving to the next, the next element, which is important for us to ask is the purpose. What is the purpose of processing personal data at a scientific uh, context? <clears throat> Um, the um, overall purpose is normally scientific research. A very important article for us is Article 89 of GDPR, where it sets the conditions for what constitutes scientific research. The, the um, regulation provides a very broad definition. It doesn't necessarily mean you're an RPO. It could be that you're a private company or a public sector organization. Uh, scientific research is any kind of research you may be conducting. Um, and um, it, it doesn't mean that it is commercial or non-commercial. So we have a pretty broad um, uh, definition of what a scientific research is. Now, the specific type of research may be useful because it explains us and it gives boundaries and limits to, as to what we can do with this data. So for instance, if I do a social research and I get this, kind, this data from, let's say, a particular segment of the population in a city in order to, for instance, just a fictional an example, to assess urban and housing conditions, I cannot then use this um, data for, uh, let's say, direct marketing. So uh, there, there is, um, that's why the type of research is necessary and it needs to be defined at the beginning when we try to set the conditions for research. And of course, uh, we start normally with one condition and as we'll see later, we may change the purpose and this is a big problem. We have to see how we accommodate it. So what happens when the purpose changes over time? The purpose always has to fit within a particular uh, legal basis. And when the purposes change, uh, then we have to check whether they're covered by the new legal basis. So moving to the legal aid basis, mostly the, the GDPR provides six basic um, legal bases and another 10 for uh, specific types of um, uh, processing. Um, the, uh, the, question, the question that we have uh, here is uh, how, how do we define uh, this um, uh, legal basis in terms of... Uh, uh, we says we normally would say this is public interest, um, but in cases when we have a tender, the legal basis may be a contract. And when you want to conduct specific research for with sensitive data, what we now call special categories of data, we may be talking about consent. I always suggest that we go for consent only, um, it's not our first option, we will do it only if it's absolutely necessary. And here you see a list of the six basic legal bases and how, what we normally do. The green light, the green color is the public interest because that's our primary uh, legal basis. That is what most research institutions are using. Legal Legal obligation is when you do the research um, or as part of uh, an obligation you have. We're not going to see that frequently or at all um, because normally the public interest legal basis covers us, but it could be that we work under contract or consent um, in cases like the ones that I mentioned before, contract thing, tenders, consent thing, a very specialized research where you want to do things and you want to absolutely make sure that you get the consent by the data subjects. The legitimate interest is the last one, and I have it in red because I think it's a highly risky uh, legal basis. It means you don't really necessarily ask the data subjects if they agree or not. You assume that your legitimate interest is not uh, harmful enough for the data subject, and hence any legitimate interest type of research requires that you have done an impact assessment. I, I really discourage uh, research organizations to, to actually do uh, base their research um, on legitimate interest. They could very well do it with public interest. And if they require specific things, they could go for consent. Here also on this table, what you see is that um, the, uh, the groups on the top, uh, there is no discretion. Uh, is part of the things you do uh, because you have to do because of your organization uh, purpose as a research performing organization. The more you go down, there is discretion. You may choose to conduct it or not, but there you, you are asking uh, the, the data subject 
fantastic to provide consent as well. So how do we actually do the whole thing? We need to trace the life cycle of the data. We need to follow the data. And, and we see that different purposes, types of data processing have different purposes and legal basis. And we always need to stay with the legal basis. And that's not self-evident. And in this diagram, which is a very simple DMP, it shows you the problem. I could collect the data, for instance, for, um, um, again, I go to my previous example. I'm doing housing research in central London and I collect this data by different residents. I get it from the data subject, plus I complement them uh, from third party. I may buy some data from a commercial entity, plus I may further enrich those data from publicly available resources from data.gov. Now, once I have this data, I need to read them. So some people need to have access and I may update or enrich them. So these are forms of processing. Uh, which need to be covered by my original legal basis. If this is public interest, and if I still operate within the scope of my work, I'm still covered. But if I take this data and I want to change the, um, uh, the scope, or so for instance, I got the data using consent forms from the data subjects, and I told them I'm going to keep them for five years, but then, I need to keep them for another five years because I need them for another type of research. Then preservation that you see here is not necessarily going to be covered by my original consent, my original database. So I have to seek for other, data, other legal bases. And here I would go for um, uh, research, uh, scientific research and public interest. Similarly, if I am to disseminate them, it really makes a difference how I disseminate them. Am I giving them to a third party? For instance, that's a data processor, a subcontractor. Unless I have these covers at the point of collection of the data, it's very difficult to make such changes. Also, can I pass this data further to other researchers? Is my public interest legal basis going to cover me? In order to be able to answer this question, you always need impact assessment. So what you see is that from the moment of collection to the moment of data sharing and in between the data management, I need to be always be, um, have a good grasp of my data management plan and why think A, action A or action B takes place and uh, respectively how purposes may change and how the legal basis may change. Now, the final thing is that when I operate under Article 89, which is when I'm performing scientific research, which as I said multiple times, it is a form of legal basis of public interest. Uh, another benefit I have is that the data subject uh, has its rights being limited. And we see that in a series of articles within GDPR, basically in um, uh, most of the articles where the rights of the data subject are defined, we have exceptions in relation to scientific research. Um, the, the, the law, uh, the general data protection uh, regulation identifies three types of exceptions that uh, uh, are related scientific research, statistical purposes, and archiving. In all cases, there needs to be public interest behind it. As I said before, that's a really broad definition. It allows us to do a lot of things, but we need to make sure we stick to that purpose. Um, and also, we need to do three more things. We need to have taken the necessary technical and organizational measures in order to protect the data subject, which means we need to have our processes written, documented, and approved. A very good practice would be to have a DMP and have it pass through our ethics committee that pretty much covers a lot of stuff and also ensures that there are the processes there. A second thing is pseudonymization, um, not necessarily anonymization. Uh, anonymization is mostly when we really want to decouple the data from the uh, data subject, but this is not necessarily always desirable or feasible. So pseudonymization is an option, and this is something explicitly mentioned by the regulation. And um, the condition which actually makes us understand whether we are in or outside the scope of the uh, regulation is whether any kind of um, request from the data subject to exercise their rights is likely to render impossible or seriously impact the achievement of the objectives of that processing which pretty much gives us a lot of space for actually 
not having always to give access or explain why we're doing X or Y with the data. Having said that, this needs to be not unnecessarily or uh, abusive. I mean, this is something we need to do within the scope um, of, of goodwill. And of course, it is necessary to always have um, uh, data sub, to also have notices and provide the data subject with the re re relevant information. So to sum up, uh, what we see is that um, uh, if we do uh, personal data processing within the context of uh, the uh, open science, it is something that could be done. It is actually encouraged. However, it means we really need to focus on the data management plan and make sure the purpose and the legal basis are always justified uh, there. So that's it for me. Thanks very much. Many thanks, uh, Thomas and Thomas. So now uh, we can start with um, the questions and, and answers. We have already a question in the in the chat, uh, so maybe we should start from that. And then we have uh, two slides where we have gathered um, some of the questions that um, we have collected. And the rest from the registration form. Okay, so we have uh, some highlights here that Thomas and then Prodromos will will reply. Uh, but uh, let's first um, check the um, the chat. I think where uh, we have a question. Okay, it's here. So, Thomas. So the uh, question, yeah, the question uh, it's about uh, the, the, the CC0, CC BY, and the fact that the attribution uh, kind request, uh, it's not always, uh, or I think seldom, uh, the question says followed. Um, yes, that's why we are presenting two options CC0 and uh, CC BY. But, you know, the main question here, and I th understand it can be frustrating for the expectations of you as, uh, as researchers is why they want attribution, right? Um, there are areas of law, and again, here I'm just explaining you the law, I'm not giving an opinion, um, that say, well, you know, your contribution here corresponds to an original work. Therefore, you have economic and moral rights, and one of these moral rights is attribution. Uh, in that case, the law tells you, well, because you're putting the director would be part of your personality into the work, then you deserve, from a moral point of view, to be recognized as the author, and therefore attribution has to be given. So, for example, when uh, uh, there is an, you use the work for purposes of, uh, say, um, quotation, then you have to attribute. The law uh, evaluates data, and we're talking about data here, differently. In fact, data, as we saw, very often it's not protected at all. You don't like it? Well, you know, we have to see what is the scope of the law and what is the scope of the lies of, uh, sorry, of, um, of science and open science in general. Is it the promotion of uh, the personality of the researcher or is it the promotion of science in general? So it's a public or a private goal that uh, it's being pursued here. Uh, the law, in, uh, in, for the law, the answer is quite clear. Data, raw data and structured data is not protected, therefore you can do whatever you want. Now, if you decide to limit it contractually, even with uh, a contract that is quite uh, uh, liberal, such as CC BY, you are reducing the space. Um, and therefore, the main recommendation for data is CC0, because it's uh, the license that uh, um, mirrors better what uh, the law considers to be protectable or not protectable. That being said, in our guides, we clearly say, well, if you feel strongly about attribution, then use a CC BY. Um, but, you know, what I would invite you to do, it's not to uh, critically, as researchers, 
apply CC BY. Think of the consequences. If you think, well, you know, in this case, you know, it's just some data I collected there. There is no really much value in it. Why restrict them further? If you feel strong, really strong about them, apply CC BY. Um, I think it's suboptimal, but still uh, fully open access and open science compliant. The important thing is to avoid uh, more restrictive uh, uh, conditions such as non-commercial. Okay, thank you. So, um, Thomas, let's try now to do the exercise. So let's um, have uh, maximum like 50 minutes. I think it's not easy <laughs> to, to do it, uh, to answer all the questions, but um, with your effort, uh, Thomas and Prodromos, let's let's see if we can do. So we have here like a set of questions that uh, people put in the, in the registration form. Some of them ask us to talk about legal issues versus opening up data, research data, uh, so p patents and open data. Uh, but we have two questions here um, about, uh, I think you have already addressed this during your presentation about uh, so raw, uh, raw data. Um, and the specific, um, uh, so uh, do you have anything to... Let me, let me just say that, you know, let's not try to, you know, be like, to try to create, uh, um, well, how do I put this? I don't know. Anyway, um, we have, if you want, so one thing is to say that uh, research data as such they are not protected by, uh, let's say, they, 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 do not, they do not qualify as a database for the purpose of, uh, of the law. Um, but what the law requires, it's very minimal. So there is a question saying, uh, uh, what if we structure uh, the data in a spreadsheet um, of observational measurements? That could be enough, you know? The important, you know, it's not the spreadsheet that it's uh, the decisive element here. It's how you strike, so how that data is, uh, uh, is organized. So the usual example here, even though it's a bit, you know, old school, it's yellow pages and white pages. So white pages is a collection of data, names and uh, phone numbers, but this collection follows like uh, an alphabetical order and is exhausted. So there is no selection and there is in, 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 uh, in how you choose the data and there is no rearrangement in how you present them. So white pages traditionally are a good example of uh, a database that is not protected. Yellow pages, because you apply some sort of selection to the data, you, you don't collect everyone, everyone's uh, name and phone number but just someone, and you follow some sort of structure there. And then when you, when you reorganize it, we, you may classify it under, I don't know, plumbers, electricians, et cetera, et cetera. Such a, that, that's a very minimal level of originality in your structure, but it might suffice. Mm -hmm. Now, the thing that we have to understand here is that this example for how we presented it works for copyright. So white pages not protected by copyright, yellow pages they are. But what copyright protects here is the structure. So how you design the selection and arrangement, which means that in the case of the yellow pages, a competitor could not reuse your structure. So the way in which you selected and presented, but he could reuse your data. So, you know, the single data, uh, well, not the single, the entire data, right? For corporate purposes, because corporate doesn't protect the data collected, only protects the structure. If on top of that in Europe, there is a substantial investment in obtaining, verifying and presenting, and this could happen both for white pages and yellow pages, then you might have a sui generis database, right? And this would prevent a competitor from extracting the same amount of data. Mm -hmm. So this is the difference. Um, what you have to do, so if you want to protect your data, just instead of publish them in a completely unstructured way, just give it some structure. That's probably more than enough to, uh, to, to, to make them protectable and apply a license. 
keep in mind that you're moving away from open science principles though. Hmm? So that's something you have to keep in mind. If your goal, if you, you really feel strong about attribution, then, you know, make sure you present the public, make available the data in a way that is protectable, but apply CC BY 4.0. Uh, and apply it properly, uh, all this information is contained in the guides. Mm -hmm. um, but otherwise, this is zero might be a much better choice. So keep, keep all these variables in mind. Yeah. Uh, yes, I think it was really explicit what you said, and thank you for that. Um, uh, so if you if you want to address any other so topic here in these questions that uh, I think you have already answered so let's uh, you can we can come back here but let's now move to the I think there is just one thing and then yes. we can move to uh, the data protection mm -hmm. keep mm -hmm. in mind the other that copyright belongs to the author the sweat generic database right doesn't belong to the author belongs mm -hmm. to the maker person or entity who makes the financial investment or takes the risk, which is normal in the university. So, you know, the point is, uh, if you want to play the game of the law, make sure you know the rules of the game, because you might have uh, um, noble intentions, but you might enter um, an area that, you know, you don't know very well, and it may backfire. So make sure what uh, you want to do and do it properly okay so uh, thomas please take a look to the um, to the question and answer box where you have some more comments from from, from mario about the, the question that he have um, put so but now we move to to and then you can answer if you have something to to head and now we move to the, uh, uh, another set of um, questions that we have gathered here from the registration form, more or less related with, with um, so privacy issue, personal data. So, yeah. Prodromos, um, do you yeah. want to? Yes, uh, and I think these are, these are very, in a sense, very classic questions. <laughs> um, we, uh, we, uh, I tried in the presentation also to bring an example from social science research. Um, as I said before, it's a absolutely crucial to have a, a clear uh, data management plan and make sure you pass through all necessary uh, steps uh, in each one of the three main, let's say, uh, parts of a data management plan. So you need to be absolutely clear when you uh, are to obtain the data to actually know what you're going to do with them. It, it seems it's very similar in that sense with how you do a copyright strategy, but when you, um, at the point of data collection, you have to have made your mind as to what you're going to do with this data. Are you just going to go do research within your RPO? Are you going to be part of a consortium? Are you going to publish the whole thing? Are you going to publish the uh, questionnaires as well? Um, and this is once you, you, you start with what you want to do. So for instance, let's say I want to have the data forever and be totally open. Or it could be, uh, I want to have the data just for my research institution. And I think both options are not really there. Um, in, in reality, you're always going to share your data with someone. And in reality, you're not going to be able, for all sorts of reasons, to fully open everything. So you need to understand that, what is the purpose of the whole thing? Why am I doing that? So if it's social research, which is about writing a paper, but it's also something which needs to be further verified by other researchers or be part of my data collection in, in my institution, or I'm doing that as part of a European project, then I need to know uh, which are the ethics rules within the context of my research. So. Uh, I use a housing example, but it could be that I do public health uh, research or I do research that relates to uh, minority groups um, or anything that has uh, special categories of data, what you, we used to call sensitive data. Uh, in that sense, of course, I have to comply with the law. It most probably means I would get, need to get consent. It would mean that the consent, has, the consent forms have to be very thoroughly checked. Um, I, by your legal department or, and, and also to be seen by your DPO. They will also have to pass through 
to your ethics committee. You should have a standard process as to how um, you, um, cl you clear uh, things off uh, legal and ethical issues and then you proceed with your research. Um, that sometimes sounds awfully bureaucratic. It may take ages, but I, I'm afraid there's no other option if you're doing research that contains personal data. Now, in terms of patient's data, there uh, it becomes a bit more um, difficult because we don't just have uh, the personal data rules, we're going to have ethic rules which relate to the university and ethics rules that may relate to the hospital or the national health system of that particular country. And here, uh, it's not such the, only the data. If you're dealing with uh, biobanks, you also have another set of regulations that relate with biomaterial and material transfer agreements. So I'll leave that totally. I, I consider that outside our discussion. If we talk about simple patient uh, data, you, you, you check what is the data protection rules in your country or your region. If we talk about the transnational project, um, you check the ethics committee of the university or the research center and the ethics rules and committee of the hospital. Now, uh, can we anonymize them? Uh, it depends really. Um, if this is not, I, I would say that pseudonymization tends to be better because you can trace it back and this may be relevant to your research. But anonymization is not just, or pseudonymization is not just a technical process, it's very much a procedural thing. Um, so it has to do with how you have access to this data and how you return to them. Um, finally, it could be that the research itself does not uh, allow you to anonymize. You need to have things which make the person identifiable and, and hence, so you may remove the name, you can still identify the person. Let's say uh, it's um, a, a woman who's in that particular region, she's over 80 years old and she has PhD. So it's probably someone, it's probably Mary. So you, you, you have a lot of these things, especially when you deal with genetic data. Uh, what has happened with the pharmacological, the pharmaceutical company? Uh, of course, this, in, in that case, you may even be a processor, not a controller. Uh, it may provide you uh, limitations that have to do with sharing or archiving, but these are not going to be necessarily limitations related to personal data or ethics. They will be confidentiality, trade secrets, or IP limitations. Um, so we also need to understand that the flow of data is not only limited by legal rules on DP or ethical rules that um, self-governing boards uh, set, but it could be also property rules. And here, uh, it's very important that we, we also have the trade secrets directive. It just, uh, it's a very recent thing in the EU. Most countries are, uh, are transposing, transposing it now, and it places quite a few restrictions on researchers conducting commercial research. How, how do we share data if they are from many different institutions? Normally, you have model consortia agreements, uh, which should be your Bible. Uh, what happens, unfortunately, is that we, people use still the very classic consortium agreement that the EU provides, which has been built for industrial property. It's extremely heavy for copyright. Um, in terms of data protection, it's basically box ticking. And in terms of how you deal with trade secrets and how you deal with sharing of property, it lets it, lets it quite open uh, to you to decide. What I always suggest is to make sure that you understand what the work packages do and what it means for the type of processing and the purposes, and then identify um, how we can actually um, uh, make sure that we have a DPO for the project and how it relates to the different DPOs of the involved organizations. Uh, finally, in terms of ownership, um, if you have personal data, they are not owned by the individuals involved. The individuals involved have rights that relate to uh, personal data legislation or personality, which are not the same thing, they are different things, or they have rights that come out of self-regulations such as the, the ones that an ethics committee would set or a professional body would set to a sector. So, Please, this would help you a lot. Don't confuse personal data with property rights. They are very different. And again, to emphasize three things which people always confuse, confidential data, they are not necessarily personal. So it could be corporate data that have to do, let's say, with the clinical trials. They don't necessarily have personal data, but you know, the, the company that paid you doesn't want you to release them. They are protected contractually and through the trade secrets legislation. Secondly, you have personal data and a subcategory sensitive or special category of data. They are personal 
personal data. These are protected through GDPR and national legislation. They are also regulated by um, uh, codes of conduct and ethics um, rules that the organizations or sectors uh, impose on themselves. And then you have personality rights, which are broader than personal data. And they may have to do with rights on images or um, rights that actually relate to the personality of the end of the individual. And then finally, you have hardcore property rights, intellectual property rights, copyrights related rights, sui generis rights from the side, let's say, of the things that look more like author's rights and similar types of things. And then you have industrial rights, patents, uh, trademarks, uh, trade secrets, plant varieties, um, uh, protected uh, names of origin, etc. So these are hardware property rights. So please don't confuse these three, these three things, confidentiality, personal data, property rights, intellectual property rights. Yeah, thank you. I think it was so, um, really helpful. Um, your input. So, Thomas, I'm not sure if you want to say something about the second comment from Mario here in the chat uh, because it's more on the. I don't see. I don't think I see it. You know, I see the chat, but uh, I only see the the original one. It is in the in the question and answer. It's uh, here. Can can you see my screen now? Uh, it's in the question and answer. Uh, can you read it? I see, your, I see your screen, but I don't see which one is it. Okay, uh, maybe you don't see. so, but you don't see the. Oh, question. okay, okay, now Oops. I'm sorry. Thank you. Okay, so um, I think uh, we. So Thomas will you know, the, will reply to uh, this. The, um. Well, it's a comment, you know. It's, yes, yes, um, it's a comment. It's, uh, it's, a view. The, 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 the only one thing to keep in mind is that uh, if it is raw data, and again, I'm pretty sure that uh, it is structured in a database, if it is not structured in a database, because if it is raw data, and this is an example of uh, what uh, um, Prodromos just said about property rights, uh, if there is no underlying property right, and you apply a license, any kind of license, uh, Creative Commons, but also a closed license, then it's only the contract that binds the two parties. There is no underlying property right. It means that any good faith third party is not bound by the contract. So it's not bound by attribution. Hmm? So the reason why they are doing it, it's because there is a perception of a community norm not a legal uh, uh, requirement, okay? So once again, I understand why you may want to do that. There may be better ways to do that. Metadata could be another way, but you know, don't, uh, once again, don't misunderstand the, the, the law because it's complex. Um, so yeah. Okay. Uh, not, not sure if you if um, you want to say something to finalize. I will just to finalize the webinar. But to Prodromos Thomas, if you want to have a final remark, just say it now, <laughs> and then we will um, close. The no, I think we webinar. would like to hear uh, any possible feedback, um, both on the webinar and on how to develop further uh, the guides. I think. Yes, this is important, and we can say yeah. uh, we can do something uh, after the yeah. webinar based on the on I, those that have participated. Yeah, I think the the, the the copyright is quite well developed. Um, what I would be very interested in is, is from the presentation to get some feedback. What would people like to see uh, in terms of um, of a guide on personal data? Is the I, I try to be extremely concise because of the limitations in time we have. But um, uh, I think we would greatly appreciate some indications as to what I think they are mostly interested in so that we can then uh, produce a guide uh, which is, is more 
oriented to these needs. I, I try to mention the basic things. How do you set up um, in terms of data protection a project? What you should take care uh, of when you conduct the project? Which are the main issues related to the DMP and open and, and GDPR? But uh, it could be that there are other things people are interested in. So please give us feedback. Yeah. So many thanks. Just before I, I close the, the, this webinar, I just want to do three final remarks. So we will ask you your, 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 your contribution and your comments. Uh, it's quite important for us to have your feedback. But I think it's important also to highlight that the way that we are trying in to organize all these new uh, guides around um, legal issues, but also others around open science, research data management, is trying to have so real user questions, so real needs, so real doubts, and then we can place it as a question and we try to to address and answer and put information via these this guides. And as we have the national open access desks, we have a strong network network delivering several presentations, several training um, um, in different countries and um, via the, net, the NOADS, the National Open Access Test, we are trying to collect this kind of questions and, and doubts. And it's, uh, it's why we are putting also the, the guides in this, in this form. Uh, so the other things that Thomas already, already um, um, presented, uh, it was about the improvements that we want to do um, about the content that we have from this legal, legal guide. So, we have all the content, the text, it's fine, the structure is uh, really good, but we want to improve a bit, we want to create some infographics, and we want even to create some more like media and videos around the content that we have, because then you can reuse it in, 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 in training activities in your institutions or to share with your colleagues or, to, or just for you to to learn more. And the last one is uh, to invite you as we have here, a large audience. I want to highlight that we will have the Open Science Fair conference in 2019 in September in Porto. Uh, all the conferences is organized around uh, workshops and training sessions. Um, we opened yesterday the call for um, proposals for uh, workshops um, and posters and demos also so we don't have like papers the additional conference it's more an interactive conference so i it's why i'm inviting you because for sure we will have um also we will address also some issues related with um uh, legal issues in open science so um put in your calendars if you if you can make it just participate and come to 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 Porto, um, because I'm in Portugal <laughs> right now, to, to participate in this, uh, in this conference. So from uh, our side, it's all. Many thanks for your participation. Per participation. We have already the slides available. We already shared with you the links, but we will send it via email, and they will be available in the, in the normal communication channels from OpenAir. Uh, please follow the Twitter of OpenAir, follow also the newsletter because it will be via these channels that we will publicize the new support materials that we will deliver in the coming months. So many thanks, uh, Thomas and Prodomus, for your effort to do this uh, great webinar. I think it was very good and helpful. So many thanks and see you. Bye, bye all. Thank you for your participation. Thank you, bye-bye. Bye, thank you. Bye. <coughs> <coughs>